What's up, everybody? How's it going, man? Welcome to Artists of Data Science Open Office Hours. Hope you guys are doing awesome today, man. We had an awesome week on the podcast, had a couple of really cool episodes that released, had one release on Monday with Max Zang of Human Prosperity. That was a cool episode packed with a bunch of tips on how to be more productive, how to be more happier. So definitely go check out that episode. And on Thursday, I released an episode with Sean Derrick, a super, super entertaining episode. He's a pretty much a crazy, mad scientist from Britain, but he's actually doing really great work in, um, in realm of, uh, you know, sustainability and things like that. So definitely check out that episode chock full of a bunch of insights from science and like science plus statistics and a bunch of just British humor, which is always fun. On Monday, I got an episode releasing with Annie Duke, who wrote Thinking in Bets and How to Decide and super excited about that episode. Uh, Thinking Bets literally changed my life. And um, actually, that was one of the books that, uh, Vin Vashista had actually uh, recommended. And Vin is here today at Office Hours hanging out, man. Vin, super excited to have you here today. Um, we've got a- How's it going? Good, man, how you doing? It's good to, good to chat with you again. It's been a while, man. I think last time we talked was uh, right before COVID got insane. Like I, I remember I was still in the office during that time, so that must've been like early March. Yeah, it was. I think it was March or April, something like that. It was yeah. as things were just kind of getting crazy. Yeah, it's been really, really insane. Here in uh, Manitoba, uh, where I live, they uh, just announced that we were going back into lockdown on Monday. And just because the situation here has been insane, like it's, it's, it's been spreading like wildfire. We've got like the highest incident rate per capita now. Uh, which is which is insane, uh, but yeah, man, welcome to Office Hours. Dude, super excited to have you here. Uh, we usually have a bunch of students pop in and just help them out, answer questions. Right now, I see we got uh, Tanusha in the chat as well. Tanusha, how's it going, man? Not only do you get to chat with me, but we got Vin Vashista, so you got two people to help you with uh, whatever it is that you need some assistance with. How are you doing, Tanusha? Uh I'm good. How are you guys? Uh, um, I'm so happy to uh, get to, get a chance to talk to you people. Oh, dude, I'm excited to to chat with you as well. How you doing? What, I'm what, good. Um, what can we? Yeah, do? go ahead. No, I just wonder what we can help you with. Yeah, I just had a couple of questions uh, regarding the uh, data science dream job course, as I've like told you before, and I just wanted to. Um, just ask you about that and like generally a few questions about career advice and such. Yeah, definitely. Um, be happy to, to answer any questions you have. So um, go for it. Yeah. So Data Science Dream Job, I guess in a nutshell, it's just a mentorship platform, probably the most awesome mentorship platform because, well, I'm a mentor for that platform. Uh, but it is geared on helping you get a job in data science. So it's definitely not a boot camp. It's not a university by any means. It's a mentorship platform where you can speak to mentors such as myself or some of my colleagues. Um, we've got a whole library of videos for helping you navigate the job search process as well as roadmaps on the skills that you need to be successful in data science and a whole slew of technical videos. We've got a really active Slack channel as well. And I host office hours just like this uh, multiple times a week. And my colleagues host office hours as well throughout the week. So there's like a total of, I mean, there's seven days in a week. I think we have eight office hours, which is pretty, pretty impressive, I would say. Um, there's no other platform I, like it that I've seen or come across. Um, but yeah, I'm happy yeah. to answer any questions you got. Uh, yeah, so that's the main point, which, which is why I was considering the course or the mentorship platform, as you mentioned, so um, persistently, because right now I'm in like a very um, a worn out stage in my job search. Where I'm like, uh, I recently graduated. Okay, I just like introduced a little bit of myself. Um, so I'm actually from India. Hyderabad, and then I moved to Dubai to do my, my um, undergrad in engineering. And then I came to New York to do my master's in management and systems, which is basically 
business analytics with uh, like a major or like a concentration in data analytics which is where i kind of like want to like uh, move my career into like a data analyst or a business intelligence or something uh, in between those um i graduated this may um and uh, i've been trying to search for a job but so far i've just secured a volunteer internship which i'm currently doing but um in in terms of job i felt like i need more of a guidance or uh, more of um someone some, something from someone who's like more experienced uh per se so that's exactly why i'm considering this course um major takeaway from for me from this course is working like the slack network which um i've read about or which you just spoke about and the mentorship and the one on ones that um you said we, you have like eight one on ones for a week and yeah so th- they're not one on ones they're many to ones so there'll be group office okay. hours there'll be numerous students in on any office hour session and they're all asking questions and they're um, it's always good to be in an environment where there are multiple people asking questions because people might have questions that you didn't even think of that are helpful to you okay. in the process um so we have multiple ones of those um throughout the week right um but uh, i just want to ask is there also like one on one mentorship that uh, the course offers or no there's nothing really that's that unique about your particular job i mean look i've i've mentored 2600 plus students there's nothing unique about your job search process i guarantee you i know that you probably got a unique set of skills you're a unique person you're an individual person but you're facing many of the same challenges that everybody else breaking into the field is facing so having to do one-on-one mentoring calls it's just it's just not the optimal use of time for mentors because yeah, we're talking, helping many, many people at once so it'll be many to one just like this like i mean vin's just that uh, joining today on the uh on on office hours but he's like not a mentor a part of the platform uh so you wouldn't have office hours with him so you should ask him questions today that you have an opportunity to uh but yeah, yeah it's many to one and like you know it's usually about 7 to 10 people per office hour so mm-hmm. they last over an hour so you'll get ample opportunity to get you know one on one assistance in that respect but you'll also be able to hear other people's questions and hear the responses that other people get and you can learn much more that way than if it was just one on one yeah i mean i understand that but like from my uh my perspective how the question um was was posed by me was like i wanted to know how uh, or if you guys do or resume reviews like how does it work in a group mentoring like yeah i mean that's something that the same thing you pull up your resume and i'd look at it and you know it just be like this like in a group setting so you'd share your screen and I'd look mm-hmm. at your resume and I provide you feedback and obviously everybody else would be looking at your resume as well which is completely okay um because then somebody else might have another perspective or somebody else might have some insight to share that would um, not be insight that I would share and, and it would benefit you so you get that added benefit when there's many heads put together Yeah um yeah that's one of the questions i had about mentorship because that's the main thing that i was looking for to someone to like um guide me with the resume or my linkedin or uh, yeah. so because- we have we have full on modules for that as well we've got modules dedicated to linkedin like how to properly do your linkedin profile as well as modules for uh resumes we've got resume templates and everything as well Mhm. Um I also wanted to ask like did, did you guys personally like right now I know you're mentoring current students who are taking the course and uh, some might have like gone through the course and have also like got their jobs something did it change or did something change because of the pandemic or how the job market is right now or um, um, Yeah that's a great question actually um Vin do you want to chime in on that what's your perspective on the job market due to covid and data science You know, it's interesting there's some some parts of data science haven't suffered at all but if you look at some of the more advanced skill sets things in the deep learning space uh, more niche towards research that suffered that's uh, a lot of companies are scaling back 
And what's interesting is they're splitting positions. So instead of having one very, very advanced uh, data science or machine learning researcher, they're splitting it into a couple of mid-level positions. So they're able to get, uh, they're still hiring and the budget in most cases is about the same. So if you're looking for a mid-level or even an intro, you know, a junior level position, COVID in some cases has made it easier to get into the field. And remote working is another piece of that. You have a lot more opportunities with different companies because they're hiring for remote work. And even though they, a lot of them will say six months or until COVID's over, but I hate to say it. I mean, we're looking at probably next year sometime. Yeah, it's not, <laughs> it's not over. It's not, not going anywhere. But in terms of, so so you mentioned that a lot of advanced research positions are um, kind of being slashed, I guess, for lack of, of better term. Why do you think that is? Is that because funds are not being allocated in that direction anymore? Or is it because there's people are just kind of reshifting their organizational focus from less exploratory type of work to more, how do we survive today? Yeah, it's the projects that are getting pushed back. So essentially the budget stays the same, but you have a reevaluation of what projects that you're going to end up working on. And so as a business, a lot of the more, I don't know, forward looking projects where they started, where they would start infrastructure or they would start hiring for projects that they're going to do in a year or complete, you know, in 18 months to two years, those projects are getting pushed out a little farther on the product roadmap. So the hiring isn't necessary, but the budget's already there. It's already been allocated and a lot of these companies aren't losing money. And so in those companies, instead of really, you know, just saying this position has been eliminated or we're reducing hiring or doing a hiring freeze, what they'll do is they'll split the position because in a lot of cases getting a really advanced uh, deep learning expert is very expensive. And so if you're pushing those projects out, uh, you know, eight quarters, six quarters, eight quarters into the future, what makes sense now is to be able to increase your bandwidth for near-term projects. What's filling the gaps and what's being pulled in that's more practical, that's shorter term revenue generating. And so those are the types of jobs that are opening up instead. And so like I said, the budget really isn't being reduced by that much. In some cases, they'll drop spending on infrastructure. That's one of the big pieces of those longer term projects is they won't be buying as much software. They won't be investing as much in, you know, on-prem or, or hybrid cloud. <clears throat> so there's some pieces that are being pulled back, but as far as staffing, everybody's looking at this as an opportunity to start poaching. Hmm. That's interesting. So, so this is a question that I hear people ask all the time, especially with, you know, mentors, mentees and days and nice dream job. It's like, Oh, well, I heard data science is, you know, going out of style, going out of fashion, like nobody needs data scientists anymore. What's your take on that? Because I feel like, if anything, this whole COVID situation probably has increased the amount of data being generated in the world because everything's happening virtually now. Um, so I feel like that part's not slowing down. We're, like, we're not generating any less data. If anything, that probably has increased since the start of COVID. What's your take on that? One of the big pieces of COVID is that with a whole bunch of us stuck inside, we're all doing research because, you know, our work days used to be two hours of commute, two and a half hours of commute sometimes, and we don't have anything. So there's some of us who have a little bit more time than we used to, and a lot of research is coming out now. So I think that's the biggest impact from COVID is that we're making just a little bit more progress, a little bit faster than we were before COVID. So that's going to increase sort of the acceleration of skills required to get into the field. So data science is obsolete in, in that sort of way. When you look at what was a data scientist four years ago, what did you need to know four or five years ago? A lot of those types of data scientists have been just kind of clinging on and not learning, not increasing their skill set, not improving or, or moving into more advanced, more specialized areas. That's been a big impact. Now you're looking at companies who are starting to cycle through talent, looking for low performers, looking for people who have the data science job title, but haven't produced much, haven't been able to push something into production, 
haven't been a team contributor. A lot of teams are really reevaluating that piece of each individual, okay. looking at how can I reallocate budget? Could I reduce headcount and increase another part of the team? We're hearing that a lot too, this whole concept of cycling out and refresh. I think I'm trying to remember some of the buzzwords that we use in mm -hmm. cycling out and refresh and that sort of thing. But what they're saying is they're, they're low performers. There are people who haven't advanced their skill set. So you're right. There's a piece of the field which is sort of obsolete and has been for two or three years. It hasn't been. Not so much that the, the way that the field does some of the more basic projects is obsolete, but some of the talent, some of the thinking, those are really pieces that are obsolete. And we have to do this in a more rigorous way. So there's pieces that are obsolete. Some a couple of things I want to touch on. There's very very insightful, um, and definitely want to dig into that a little bit more. But first, I just want to welcome Nicholas into the chat. Nicholas, thank you for for swinging by again. Good to see you again. Um, we've got the pleasure of having Vin Vashista on today's office hours. One of the top voices for data science, uh, LinkedIn top voices in data science last year. Super privileged to have him here. So if you got any questions, um, definitely. Uh, feel free to butt in at any time. The same goes for you, Tanusha, as well. Like if you got questions, feel free to jump in at any time. Um, but going back to, to what you're saying earlier, Vin, about um, a particular type of data scientist. Now, when you say a particular type of data scientist, is that a particular type in the sense of the skills that they have, or a particular type in terms of their, I guess, mindset, personality trait? Like, what did you mean by that? It's a little bit of both. There's a software developer heavy data scientist who's not so much involved in the actual model uh, design, model selection, model validation piece of it, as they are building the models or optimizing. So they, they're code heavy and you know, science light, model and algorithm knowledge light. They do a lot of import from those that's sort of an obsolete skill set you're also seeing the analytics side of the field where we've overtitled a lot of people who are analysts we've sort of pushed them into service because data science and analytics weren't that different three years ago in most businesses There's really not a whole lot of, of delta between the two so they got pushed into the data science role with an intent that they were going to grow, they were going to learn into, sort of train into the role and they haven't. Those are the two edges that I, I see. There are, you know, like I said, more software development focus, more technical focus, and more analytics focused, more data focused rather than, I mean, kind of data wrangling side of it, really, just really heavy data wrangling, data analysis, exploratory data but not very strong on the modeling side of it, not very strong on the implementation and deployment. So if I um, understand that correct, so there's the types of data scientists who may have gotten that title, but have not really increased their skill set, haven't learned or developed in their journey, kind of resting on their laurels, so to speak. Um, and then there's the type that all they have are these hard technical skills and can't necessarily navigate what it's, you know, what, what it takes in terms of soft skills, I guess. In my, did I kind uh, of get that right? They don't really understand the math behind the algorithms. When you import from, it makes it easy. I mean, there's a lot of great applications for import from type machine learning because it's quick. You can get a lot of value out of two weeks of development time if you're doing a lot of import from. Mm -hmm. You can even customize a lot of the libraries like TensorFlow with so much control over customization. And that's the piece that a lot of the, the employees and data scientists that came from the technical side of the world just didn't, didn't reskill. The, it can sometimes make it so easy that you lean on it too much. And so you're importing from and just doing generic train test. There's no concept of validation post, uh, post model development. There's no real concept of going back and understanding the data a little bit better to understand if there's, a, you know, where your gaps are. Was it gathered well enough? Did you really put in the work to make sure that your data 
represents what you think it does was pulled from the data source that you thought it was is it are you really modeling the data or are you actually building a model that represents a system under measurement there's a lot of complexity there that someone who's very very technical sometimes doesn't see the value of man that's uh that's very very insightful a lot to to digest there as well uh, actually, I was making a similar point last week during office hours to the effect that, yeah, you don't necessarily need to know all the math to get your first job in data science, but you had better learn and pick up the intuition behind the import statement. Otherwise, you are going to find yourself in a position where you're just fucking shit up. <laughs> and not know <laughs> why it's fucking up and you're gonna get fired <laughs> you know what's funny is if you don't if you're not doing any monitoring in production you don't yeah. even know it's messed up yeah yeah i had a model uh so i'm like you know the first data scientist in in an organization I'll, literally the first one they hired the only one i was uh working on on a model that um, got deployed into production and it took me i think from the moment I first started looking at raw data to having this thing deployed in production uh, with the help of a solutions architect and another software engineer took about six, seven months for that to happen. Uh, wow. um, which I like to think was kind of fast when it's just a one person team doing everything um, except the actual integration into the larger software. But uh, just recently started to collect data for for model evaluation model monitoring and stuff like that and that's something that doesn't get taught too much anywhere and the amount of literature that's out there there's there's not much and you kind of have to piece things together and it's at this stage where it was okay well there might not be books out there but i know a shit ton of statistics and i know a shit ton of math because you have a graduate student in it let me fall back on what i learned in school to help me develop some way to adequately assess whether or not this, this model is performing the way I intended it to. And I guess that's where it becomes really important. Yeah, it is. Oh, hey, Nicholas, sorry, I didn't say hi. I apologize. <laughs> not a problem. That's actually exactly what I was going to ask about today too. So I did a project. I took my personal Google data, I downloaded it, and then I, did some topic modeling on it and I, it, the project allows me to put in a start date and a stop date and it shows me the different topics of my search queries back in between whatever date and time I put in and it works fine on my own data and if I want to deploy that I, I get how for like a, a simple classifier you just save it say you're using Python and you, you pickle it and then you deploy you use like a flask or django or a web development framework and load the model into that and then pr call predict on new data but for unsupervised learning you can't i don't know of a way of like exporting the model is that can you do the same process so you're saying with an unsupervised model you want to put it in production like what are you trying to do you're trying to cluster new observations into a new yes yeah, so like group so the end goal is someone can upload their google data and put in start date and stop date just like i did with my own and it would return them their topics uh and i don't know why but i get the, i got the feeling that it's different than just saving it and loading a linear regression model, for example. Yeah, that's a great question. I don't have a answer to that off the top of my head. Uh, Vin, what are your um, thoughts? It depends on how are you building the model? I mean, I know you're using Python, but so it's, the model that you're building right now, is, is it a supervised learning model that you're using? Is it just regression or are you using something else? No, 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 it was, what did I use? Uh, I used NMF and LDA and the NMF performed better, but they were both like NLP. And I searched around the internet 
or different ways of doing this. And there's not much, there's tons of how to build the classifiers and models. And then when it comes to deploying, there's less and even less for unsupervised. Yeah, there really is. Um, so like I said, you built it in Python. What format is your built model in? What do you mean? Um, so, okay, you do train tests and you have a, there's a model output. What did you put it? Like you said pickle. If you use TensorFlow, you can actually serve it out directly and use TensorFlow serving to, to serve it as a, a service, as a RESTful service. So what did you get out once you were done? I guess, where are you at once you finish? You've done the training and testing piece, right? Uh, I mean, there, I'm trying to remember. Let me just open up the GitHub repo. Uh, while you're pulling that up, man, I just want to welcome Curtis into the chat. Curtis is, uh, he's joining in from, from the UK. He, Curtis, man, how you doing? I'm good, man. Nice to meet everybody. Hello, hello. Yeah, man, good to see you again. Curtis is, uh, him and I are going to be chatting on Sunday. Uh, he's going to be on the podcast for an episode. Curtis does some amazing uh, writing. Check out his work on Towards Data Science and on Medium, I believe, right? Oh, nice. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He's got some uh, amazing articles up. Um, he's actually been ranked one of the top contributors in AI. Uh, and, and I mean, I wouldn't take it that far, but <laughs> if you want to put it like that, I mean, Medium has his own like um, uh, ranking system where they give people um, like, uh, boy, little achievements for good reach in certain fields. So in the artificial intelligence category, um, I'm ranked as one of the top writers. So, but I mean, not globally, just on medium. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, that's still, that's huge, man. That's, yeah, 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 cool. yeah. Yeah. So I'm looking at it right now and I used the NMF library in uh, scikit-learn. And, but I, what I was wondering is because it's, a model like created on my data specifically, I can't just save the model and process new data in it, can I? Yeah, I mean, if it's a model that is trained using your data, it's not gonna really generalize to, to me or Vin or Tanusha. Um, so, you know what I mean? I guess, I guess in general, when you do clustering, how do you deploy a clustering algorithm? I've never deployed a clustering, like an output from clustering. I've used the output from clustering as an input to another, like as a feature in itself. Mm -hmm. um, so I've never like, yeah, I've never, I'm not sure people do it, but I've, I've never like deployed a clustering model. I've I don't think that many there. people do it because there wasn't tons of information online. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you can basically a lot of, a lot of times clustering models or classification, you're, you're doing classification, right? Uh, no, this, this wouldn't be classification. It would be, it would be more, I don't, I don't, I mean, it's, it's topic modeling. Hmm. Yeah. I, so I get where you're going. What you're actually doing is analytics. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. and that's why I was kind of asking what the format of the output was. Cause I, I had a feeling you were doing analytics, but I didn't want to, I mean, I know about two minutes of it, so I didn't want to make an assumption there. <laughs> but what you're doing, the output of what you built is analytics. And so typically you would feed this into a dashboard versus actually deploying this because you don't really have a model to deploy. Yeah. There's nothing that it would really serve as far as inference. Uh, I mean, I guess you could, you know, if you extended it, you, you could, but it, you know, like you said, it, it's not really going to generalize that well, yeah. but you could improve it so that it did. And, you know, you're on a track where you could deploy this. Yeah. Yeah. So kind of like just one thing that's coming to the top of my head, right? So you can cluster your observations, right? Um, using your clustering algorithm, right? And then any new point that comes in, are you trying to say, this new point, which cluster do you belong to? Is that kind of the gist of what you're trying to get to? I could do that, but I didn't find it that very interesting project, so I didn't do mm -hmm. that. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, because then at, at, that's like, would that be considered semi-supervised? No, I probably wouldn't. But I mean, because clusters aren't really ground truth, right? So you have some clusters with your quote unquote training data and then anything that comes in, you're trying to classify that to belong to one of these different clusters. I suppose then at that point, you probably use something as simple as just like KNN mm -hmm. maybe, but yeah, it just depends on what it is that you're that you're trying to use it for. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I see where you're going with the topic modeling. I, I just think right now what you've done needs a little bit more data fed into it. And, you know, you're trying to figure out what topics based on your, your Google search history you said, or just your Google like lifetime. Google search specifically. Okay. Yeah. If you're doing Google search data, um, it's almost like you're, you're doing like a logging search, right? Cause you're just looking at what, what you put into the search bar, right? Or are you looking at the results too? Uh, I mean, I have the results too, but for this, I, I just looked, I just did it based on like a clean query. Okay. And what were your, like, if you could name two example topics, what would they be? Oh, uh, for me, one of them was data science. One of them was fitness related. Okay. And then it, it, the, the algorithm would output the top like five or ho however many words specified that were like the most common or characteristic of it, like the weights of each. All right, so you're trying to say that, you know, if somebody gave you the search history, you could say here are the, the top categories of the terms you search for, like you, yeah, you, know, so, you have fitness and technology, something like that? Well, the way, it, the way it works is like, I would just put in, I would input my data. I would say, feed me all, like show me my search trends over 2011 all of 2011 and then it would show me the top X number of categories and the top X number of words in each category. And it would be based on my search history. So I could just put in different dates and see like, what I was like, interested in at that time. Yeah. It sounds like analytics type of stuff. Yeah. I, I don't think it's, yeah, I, th I think it's mainly, I think you're right in, in analytics. Yeah. But I mean, it's not, that's not the end of the world for that particular project. A lot of times uh, that's, you know, that's just exploratory right there. So you're looking at your data, you're beginning to understand what you got from your data set and what you might see in new data sets. This is kind of how it starts. That's not, you know, when I say it's just analytics, what I really mean is it's like that you've, you're in the first phase of building a model. You're starting to look at data. You're starting to make some assumptions about what you might see in other data sets if you gathered more. You're starting to think about how you might want to gather some more data, try to get some more people interested in giving you some data that you could then turn into a larger project. So you have the beginnings of a project here. So like I said, when I say just analytics and we say just analytics, it's not that simple. You're doing something that's the very beginning of a larger project. So, I mean, definitely keep going. You're probably onto something pretty interesting. Yeah, got it. Thanks. I'm curious. Uh, useful feedback. What's, uh, I guess, what's the, the main question you're trying to answer with your, with your project? Like, what's the, the ultimate objective? Well, first, I was just curious what data I could get out of my Google history, given that like, the California data regulations that allow us access to whatever, a lot of what they have on us. And so then I looked at it and they give you a, a nice big old HTML file it's not formatted well. So like in order to explore, I had to convert the HTML into a CSV. And then I realized that there's actually a lot there and it's a similar format for all of the pro for a lot of their products like YouTube also. And it shows not only what you search, but the websites you visited in the exact location of the search in, in GPS coordinates. And so I was just playing around seeing what I could get out of that and realized that I can see my searches from today, but like, what was I searching for a month ago? I can go back and look at all the searches, but that's a pain, not easy to understand. So what if I like bucket it into different things? I see, so you're trying to like get a sense of, okay, where, what have my interests been going, you know, month to month across time or what, and whatnot. Yeah, or even years back, say, like, what yeah. was I interested in 2011, 2012? I got it, that sounds interesting. Yeah, that sounds pretty cool. Curtis. That is. Hello. Yeah, do you got any, uh, got any input here? I'm, I'm still trying to get the general gist, but 
I see. It's, yeah, I'm. I'm yeah. just listening. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah. No worries. No worries. Cool. But yeah, it does sound sound like good. I like the idea of that project, man. That does sound cool. Like, how have my interests changed over time? Yeah, and I also reworked my resume a bit and put that in the star format. <laughs> that was the that was the the S. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to pull it up and take a look at it? Uh, not right now. Okay. <laughs> How's everything else going, man? Pretty good. Pretty good. I was listening to your podcast on predicting churn because I had actually done a churn prediction project. Oh, nice, man. Hopefully, you, I'm working for. Yeah, hopefully you enjoyed that. I interviewed uh, Carl Gold, who's the chief data scientist at Zora. Mm -hmm. um, and that, was, that was cool. He wrote the book Fighting Churn uh, or... Yeah, fighting churn with data, and his book is super, super good. It's super comprehensive, um, and it, he just really stresses the importance of feature engineering. Yeah, and, and I think that hands down is like one of the things that pays off the most when you are building a model. Vin, what's your what's your uh, take on that? On churn modeling or feature engineering? Uh, feature engineering, in, in terms of the payoff you get for the um, for the effort you put in. Well, the thing about feature engineering that scares me is you're introducing your own bias into it. Mm. That, you know, the good side of feature engineering is that you have a whole lot of insight into how your model actually works, which is great. You have, you can explain it a whole lot better if you've got that level of control over it. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, you also introduce your own bias into, if you're not, obviously, you, you you have a very large group of people who do this correctly, but you also have a very large group of people who don't. And yeah, it, it worries me anytime you put that much of your own thought into it without actually validating, without going in and doing, because I'm, I'm kind of thinking in the causal way, because Judea Pearl has been active all of a sudden on Twitter and pointing out some good papers and there's, there's a lot of work that we've missed over the last five years. And so when you start talking about feature engineering, I guess you're bringing up a totally different topic in my head, but yeah. It, it, Talk it, to me about some of the ways you've seen it done uh, badly. Uh, I'd love to, love to hear about some of those examples. I've seen actual hand spun features, like people looking at data, analyzing it, <clears throat> hand building that as a feature and not doing any sort of validation at all just saying, I saw the relationship, therefore it's there. And that's, mm. that is not, not the scariest thing that I've seen because in a lot of cases you can introduce that bias into feature engineering with using some of the more traditional approaches, using some of the more, some of the approaches that look rigorous on the outside, mm -hmm. but really what's happening under the surface is you're picking features and you're saying my model will have this this particular data point of this particular weight and you're just hand spinning rather than actually doing feature engineering and the two can get confused so easily. Yeah. So, so let's like, cause when I think of feature engineering, I think of it as a way to build out complexity that you can't necessarily uh, get just from the raw data. Right. So for example, if we have transactional data, that's on the granularity of one row uh, per customer, per transaction over n number of transactions. And that's kind of what the raw data looks like. And if we're trying to get to a place where we're trying to, to model a, I don't know, uh, whether or not, let's just say a customer is um, going to make a purchase in, in the next whatever time period. Um, so when I think of feature engineering, I think of, okay, how can I take this data, this historical data from this, customer that's on this granularity of one row per customer per transaction date into something that's just one row per customer and how can i aggregate and capture that complexity in in one row vector um, and you know some some things you could do is calculate the number of times they've purchased the average amount of purchase the average time between purchases um, the length of time they've been a customer, the length of time since their last purchase. So like, that's kind of where I go to when I think about feature engineering. What are your thoughts on that? Would that be, would that be me inadvertently injecting my bias into it? Or would that be kind of the 
correct-ish way to do it? You know, it's funny what you're describing. I would call sampling, like you're creating your cohorts or you're creating your segments. Mm -hmm. And I would actually, I mean, I don't, I don't know if that's feature engineering in my head at least. Maybe I'm thinking of something totally different, but mm -hmm. yeah, that sounds like what I would call almost sampling where you're doing exploratory data analysis to figure out what, um, what cohorts or what groups or what segments you want to break your sample up into. And you might want to use that for more of a, a sampling methodology where you go through and you're making sure that your data actually has representation for each one of those groupings and each one of those cohorts because you're aggregating a whole bunch of data points to, uh, to understand this person. But at the same time, that aggregation can apply, you know, and you're going this way, that aggregation applies across multiple customers and there'll be similarities there between those customers. And I look at, I see that as more of a, a segmentation and sampling methodology. Yeah. You know, yeah. and when you say feature engineering, I'm thinking more like the old school, like BI, data mining, you know, there's a lot of that leftover mentality where feature engineering, where you're talking about it, has a whole lot of useful applications. Like what I was saying, I see that as like a segmentation piece. Mm -hmm. But old school, you know, data mining has this concept of feature engineering where you're almost building an expert system and sometimes you become the expert and that's a really scary way of doing feature engineering is because you make that assumption that you have expertise, you know what features matter because you've done some analytics or like I said, even some old school BI where you've looked at a report and you think you know what the features that correlate well with each other or that have some, you know, some sort of impact on the system under measurement or whatever influence that you're trying to serve up. And a lot of people make that mistake of, I know it, therefore it is, versus I'm gonna use the data to prove a particular piece that I see intuitively just by looking at it. So instead of using their prior knowledge and as a starting point, they use it as the end point. Then they go back and look at the data and prove it rather than <clears throat> proving it, starting out with that as a hypothesis and then going forward, gathering new data and proving it. And uh, I cannot remember her name. There's somebody who wrote a, a really wonderful post, chief decision scientist at Google, she wrote a post a couple of weeks ago about data, data charlatanism oh, and using uh, data Cassie, out over Cassie. Cassie. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah she, I, saw, I read that. I read that post. That was a really good one. Yeah. And every time I hear feature engineering, like that's what I think of is somebody who does the process in reverse. Yeah. It's that, that's interesting. I, I, yeah, Cause when I hear feature engineering to me, it just is a way to build out complexity from the raw data into something that can be used uh, by a algorithm to pick up some signal. Like for example, right? Like having just height and weight by itself, probably not useful, but if you take a function of height and weight and express it as something called BMI, that might be more useful for uh, a predictive model. Yeah, and like I said, that's, you know, when you use your intuition, but then you go back and prove it. You say, okay, BMI, I believe BMI is correlated with something, mm -hmm. you know, call it whatever you want to health, heart attack. You can use whatever it is that you want to say that BMI has some relationship to this outcome here. And a lot of times people just stop right there. Now BMI is an input into their model and they never come back to validate whether that aggregation did anything. And in a lot of cases, you know, BMI is actually a great example because BMI has limited usage. There's a lot of flaws to BMI, and there's a lot of new measurements that are out where <clears throat> you know, you're looking at more complexity as far as subcutaneous fat versus visceral fat versus your, your BMR, uh, you know, the amount of muscle that you have, because there's bodybuilders, that are massive, absolutely huge, 8%, 9% body fat, mm -hmm. and their BMIs are off the chart. And you know, there's some evidence that that's unhealthy. There's some evidence that that is healthy. And, you know, so you bring up this wonderful thing that just by aggregating that one to that one uh, data point, I guess, BMI, you have all of, the, you've, un, you've kind of unraveled all of these new questions that if you go deep enough into validating BMI, you get to realize that there's more data points at play. There's other things that you didn't know maybe were in the data or that aren't in your data that may be better to use than BMI. 
Or you may look at BMI and say, look, this is accurate enough. And if you go back and do that validation where you do more of an exploration between your aggregation and this new, this new data point that you've come up with through feature engineering and an actual outcome, is there any relationship between the two? Is there something else that might have a better relationship to that? Is there a better way of aggregating those two you know, into a better feature? That's where I think feature engineering is as powerful as you're talking about because you really are. You're pushing complexity into something smaller, but you're also opening up a larger question. And I think that a lot of times what ends up happening is you don't explore that question. That's where I get scared about feature engineering is that the model's built, the assumptions baked in, you just assumed VMI was useful. You didn't validate it. And so you build the model and that assumption's baked in, comes out the other end and no one's checking. And so instead of, you know, it sometimes substitutes for uh, the rigor of data science rather than opening up the complexity that you're talking about and opening up all these questions where you say, was that a good idea? Was there something better? Are there other numbers? Am I gathering the right data? That's why I think, you know, feature engineering is kind of that double-edged sword. So to address that point of, of um, you know, are we just, are we actually assessing it, making sure that this thing is, are we validating it? Like, would, would you say that, is kind of the feature selection aspect of it? Or is that, are we going down the wrong path here with respect to that? You know, I, I think that, I think that, and I'm gonna say this very clearly, I think that <laughs> this is not a, not a widely held opinion. You, you have to do experiments. Mm -hmm. And yeah. without them, what comes out the other end of the modeling process is kind of scary because there isn't this sort of validation that was done. There's no experimental process that was part of the model validation. You, you build a model based on a, <clears throat> on a data set. Even if you do that, you know, 70, 30, 80, 20 split where you do training testing, that's not done. That model is and the problem kind of what I'm talking about with feature engineering is that's where people stop train test, deploy and there's no validate there's no experiment that gets done and sometimes it's a simple experiment just run it in parallel in production see if it, if it performs better than alternative and that can be you know sometimes that's as simple as a company needs to go because models are really simple really complex and, you know don't don't be unreasonable but the more complex the model is the more data you're throwing into it the more need there is for a rigorous experiment of that in the front end, you've trained a model, tested a model, you've essentially modeled the data. You haven't really modeled the system, you've just modeled that data set that you ended up doing the training and testing on. And so now you start talking about out of sample, you start, start talking about validation. <clears throat> and there's a ton of ways to do that, but I think the most rigorous way is then to come back and say, now I'm gonna control the data gathering. I'm gonna control each piece of this to verify that the model, build this experiment with the model as the hypothesis in the center of it. And sometimes that model creates multiple hypotheses that you are working on either, you know, multiple experiments to validate each core component of them. Obviously you can't, you know, validate the whole thing. I'm, saying, I'm not going, I'm not going crazy, but the core components of the model, the core, the core architecture has to be validated each assumption, each major assumption that's baked into that model. And, you know, when you talk about feature engineering, by doing feature engineering, you're baking an assumption into the model. And each one of those has to go through some sort of experimental validation. And in some cases, that's not possible. You know, and that's the, you know, that, that actually leads me down to where GDA Pros has started to very actively hate on machine learning <laughs> and say that it's not rigorous enough because in some cases you can't do the experiment. So what then? And he's proposed an entire framework for how to do uh, sort of connecting the dots between building a deep learning algorithm and proving it out, sort of doing this rigor without being able to do an experiment. And I think that's where, in my head, that's where feature engineering fits, mm -hmm. is that you're baking an assumption into the model, that assumption needs a validation point beyond just training, testing, deploying. And sometimes, like I said, it's as simple as just running into production, 
and performance versus current or alternative. But that requires a lot of monitoring because you really haven't validated the assumption. You just kind of go on a step further to say this model performs well and I just proved it performs well. But the assumption that you bake into a feature, that when you do feature engineering or any sort of aggregation process, when you're aggregating data or grouping people together, that assumption is now baked into the model and it has to be validated. So when you say we're modeling the data, so I guess the 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 argument there is that, okay, we've got this data set, let's build a model that just perfectly models this data set, but not the real world data generating process that actually generated this data. So now when we do have real world data that comes in through this real world data generating process and we have it hit our model and it gives us a result, that result would not be validated because of the way that we have built our model. It's just based on this one little sample of, of data, right? Is that, am I understanding yeah. that correct? Yeah, and even sometimes when you do more complex validations, you're still validating the same data set. Even if you do hold out and, and you have a more rigorous approach to it, if it's all, if you, all you're doing is modeling one data set from one particular gathering methodology, even if it's over a long period of time, even if you grab two years, build your model on two years worth of data, and then you validate it against the third year, you've, your gathering has baked some assumptions in there. And so you have to, that's why I go back to the experiment, that model's a hypothesis. And if it's not explainable enough to build an experiment on, it's dangerous. Especially if you're, you know, in feature engineering, this kind of the micro, but looking at the macro feature engineering of data gathering, anytime you gather data, you are in some way, shape or form feature engineering because you've decided how you're gonna gather the data. But in a lot of cases, there's no pedigree to the data. It's just sitting there in a repository somewhere. How did, how did it get gathered? I don't know. What's been done to it since you did gathering? I don't know. And so you have this huge black hole of assumptions that there's already been feature engineering done on your data set. And so a lot of times what your model does is it's a representation of the data in a different form. And that's all your model ends up being. And you have <clears throat> just these gaps because you assume that the, the space that you're, that you're presented with in the data is exactly the same as what you need to model. And that's a piece baked into the model itself. Because like I said, it just, it's just a representation of your data in a different form and where that becomes problematic is it's not measuring a system it actually has no connection to the system under measurement and so if you're talking about something behavioral especially you know back to the customer example if you're talking about something behavioral in nature you're not modeling a complex system that has no connection in any tangible way to the data set that you have. You know, you have some purchase data, you have a little bit of customer history, some interaction maybe with the website. How often did this person come to the website? How often did they check out this one particular product before they bought it? How long do they spend on page? How much do they read? How much does, you know, some of your recommender systems help them to help to funnel them to a part of purchase? All that's great data, but none of that's behavioral data. You are looking at emergent outcomes of behavior. You are looking at emergent outcomes of a decision-making process. You're not measuring that process, you're measuring a particular kind of emergent behavior of a complex system. And so your data set hides what you're actually trying to model. And that's, like I said, that's the piece that you need to go back and rigorously validate. Because in a lot of cases for a business, that's cool. Like that'll give you enough value and return on investment. So that's totally cool. You can bake in some assumptions. It can be way, way off from perfect. And it's all good because you know, all you need to do is increase margin by 8%. And so you don't really need to understand the complexities of how Ryan or everyone like Ryan makes a decision. And so sometimes modeling that data set is sufficient as long as you understand the limitations of that model. What happens in other cases is you ex overextend your, 
overextend your influence, overextend your accuracy metrics. And you say this model is accurate to X percent, but it really isn't. And we all know that because it's accurate to X percent based on this particular data. And unless I go through another step, I'm not gonna be able to extend that to say really anything beyond it. And you can run it in production and A-B test it and make the customers angry because you A-B test and they hate that. And so there's all these different validation mechanisms that you can use to make sure that what you're saying and what you're expecting the model to do, it actually does. And it'll actually live up to your expectations, both from a business perspective and what you're saying to people. Because you're, when you deploy a model, especially about customers, you're making statements about that customer. And you're telling people that in some cases. And what often happens, and this is what Cassie was referring to, is that you're out over your skis. You're not actually able to make the prediction that you're making. You're not predicting anything. You just analyze the data and the model is a complex version of analysis. And so you have to go back if you want to make some of these assessments about why a customer does what they do. That's when you need to begin to go backwards, do new data gathering, and begin to understand the system that you're modeling rather than the data that you've built a model on. That show is super profound, man. Um, yeah. yeah, seriously. Yeah, um, I 100% agree with everything you're saying. So how can we, okay, so which question do I wanna ask, man? Um, okay, so let's start. We only got a few more minutes left in office hours, but uh, I think one question people are really gonna benefit from is when you say a model is a hypothesis, explain to us what you mean by that. And if it if a model is a hypothesis, how can we conduct experiments to make sure that we are capturing the real world data generating process and modeling the system and not the data? So when I say a model is a hypothesis, this is your version one. You know, like I said, you <clears throat> you've gone through iterated over multiple models. You figured out which one's the most uh, most capable is a great way. I don't like accuracy, but which one's the most capable of modeling your data in an accurate way, of becoming a best representation of that particular data that you have. And you're gonna validate against that data. Sometimes you validate it against the set that you've held out and that hasn't been part of the train test cycle. And so you're gonna do levels of rigor when it comes to you know, sort of supporting your model. You wanna be able to say this model does well, this model performs well. This model seems to be X accurate. Why? Now you gotta answer why. So -hmm. that's your hypothesis. I've come out and I've said this model works. And now, you know, I don't know if you've been, I've been beaten up by science panels, but PhDs have destroyed me and my models in the past because I didn't take this next step. I said, my model works here. I've done all this rigorous validation. I've done, you know, uh, you know, what I've talked about with the holdout data with totally different data set I've validated in production, it works really, really well. Why? Uh, my model's my hypothesis. Now I have to prove to you it works. And to do that, I have to understand why. So your model is your hypothesis. The architecture, the weights, all of those components make up your hypothesis. And my hypothesis is this is why some behavior, some prediction that I'm making is accurate. Now I have to go prove that. And so you have to create an experiment. And this gets very, very deep into explainable machine learning. If I don't, if I don't understand, and you know, a lot of deep, <clears throat> deep learning models are really hard. How, to, how do you pull one of those things apart when you have millions of features? Terabytes and terabytes and terabytes and terabytes of different data sets that you fed into this thing. Now, how do you unravel all of this to figure out anything that you can actually test? And there's your complexity. So your model, no matter how complex is your hypothesis, you haven't proved it. Even if it runs for six months in production, it doesn't matter. You know, think about a hurricane model. If I munged a whole bunch of data about hurricanes together, created a machine learning model, whatever, you know, pick your algorithm, or ensemble or whatever, and I've, I've thrown it out there and it's been accurate for six months. 
do you think anybody in that community would look at your model as anything? Would they look at it as valid? And thank you very, very much for that. I want to open the floor up to either uh, Nicholas or Curtis. If you guys got questions to ask Vin, man, go for it. Now is the time. Yeah, I'm curious about the experiment you've designed because you said like feature engineering in itself, even with industry expertise, isn't enough. And the model as, as a hypothesis, and sure you have to prove that you have to prove it correct. And how do you go about doing that? And is it necessary for small scale, like really really small scale things, or is this only for like large corporate projects that? are going to be hit, like endpoints are going to be hit millions of times. Well, I, I, so I want to be reasonable. That's the, that's the number one thing that I say, especially in, in corporate environments. I'm talking about the rigor because this has to be applied to everything you build, but there are levels of rationality that you have to also bring in because your project's only got so much budget. You've got a time crunch. More, more times than not, the business doesn't understand what science is. So that's, you know, kind of going to have to ground whatever you do. But even in small projects, you want to make sure that your model functions somehow. You don't want to just throw it into production. You don't do train test drop. So you want to do some sort of production validation. You want to verify that versus whatever alternative that they're using right now it performs better. And so that's kind of your minimalist validation piece. And then you can go all the way out to a more extreme point where you design an experiment, where you, you now control all of the data gathering, because that's what you didn't get the first time, in most cases at least. You didn't get to, you don't get the data pedigree. And so you don't really get to examine your variables uh, as any sort of relationship to each other, to the outcome. You don't understand how aggregating them may have lost some of the information that you needed. In some cases, like I built a pricing model where a base, you know, a base assumption that increasing price would increase margin is bad. That, that's not true because there's more factors to margin. Now I've exposed something, I've verified, you know, I tried to validate my assumption, my assumption was wrong. Okay, let's go back. Now, okay, so it, it, margin is price and cost. All right, we got it. So we buy the product for this much, we sell it for this much. If I increase the price, the cost stays the same, you know, the purchase cost stays the same, then I'm gonna increase margin. Wrong. There's also other costs. There's other variables involved in cost, aside from just what I bought it from. In some cases, there can be shipping involved. In some cases, there can be the time that it sits on the shelf and the space that it takes up on a shelf. And so by verifying all of these assumptions, doing just these little simple experiments, you know, if I throw in mock-up data, and I assume something's gonna happen and it doesn't in the majority of cases, I've done an experiment and I've refuted the hypothesis of my model or one of the hypotheses of my model. And so it, it can be that basic. Could a form of experimentation be something where maybe you deploy, you go through a, a process, you come up with some some candidate models and from this selection of candidate models you identify some models that seem to perform really well um, based on you know your your training test uh, portion of, of the model building process and uh, similar performance across let's say multiple models and you decide to deploy those and serve the average of these model outcomes as the customer facing you know prediction what have you and kind of assess how each individual model performs um, in production. Does that make sense what I'm kind of describing? Yeah, it does. It's like exactly. shadow testing, essentially, right? Yeah. Championship and, model. Yeah, and you know that happens a lot. I, mm -hmm. As far as how valid is it, uh, it's scary. Anytime you serve the average of multiple models, you are... Uh, you know, it's almost the decision tree <laughs> yeah. effects starting to happen. There's, uh, there's maybe so many holes here that I don't know about. And, yeah. and that's, like I said, anytime I average the out, you know, the output of a bunch of models, I'm assuming I'm going to get a better model out of it or a better result out of it. 
And there's some cases where you're not going to because you're one of them could be garbage in production. Yeah, I'm trying to. Yeah, I'm trying to put it into words, and I'm losing it right now. But yeah, yeah, it, you could have one of them be absolute garbage all the time, and you wouldn't notice it because the other ones are just kind of, <clears throat> I don't know, beating it out. Yeah. And then how do you gauge which one's right? You know, what's the right answer? And you start talking about optimization in a lot of cases. You know, you know, in a lot of cases, it's not as easy as that's a monkey. That's somebody's hair. That's a pair of headphones. It's not so cut and dry on the validation side, you know, especially with pricing. That's why I love pricing as an example. What's your optimal price? What was the what was the highest amount that you could charge that individual? And what's the right answer? Like, how do you figure out? You can't do an experiment like that. You know, that's one of those experiments where you don't, you can't really do that because there's no way to get them to not lie to you. And so you're now in sort of this position where you have all these assumptions baked into the pricing model and now you got to validate against some sort of idea of right best optimal and that gets really hard and especially if you have multiple models now playing together and serving up different prices because this is normally what pricing models do is you got a ton of different models doing a ton of different things sometimes they're both serving a price and that price gets you know not really average, but the aggregation aggregate of both predictions it turns in, you know, feature engineering, talk about feature engineering gets sort of served up as a price and there's no way to verify like what's optimal. So verifying it in that case is just, it's a nightmare. Is it ever okay to build a biased model? Yeah. Oh yeah. No. Think about hiring. No. You know, I don't, I, I am, I, I want to bias towards the candidate. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not, that's a great bias. I want to pick the best candidate. And so that's a scoring, it's a ranking. But at the same time, I want to give every candidate the best possible score because relative to each other, that bias is fine. It waits out, but it ensures that I'm not taking points away from somebody because of something small in the, the NLP side of the algorithm, you know, just because they didn't word for things perfectly, you know, that that ended up being a, some sort of feature that got baked in further down the road. I don't want to discriminate against that person because of the way that they use language. I want to make sure that everybody gets the maximum credit. So I want to bias that algorithm during training to rank the candidate as high as possible rather than you know, trying to look at eliminating the candidate. And so trying to rank that person as low as possible in order to eliminate as many candidates as possible. So that's, a that's an instance where I've used bias towards the candidate. I've made the model give the candidate as high of a score as possible so that I was including as many candidates into the, into the review and selection process rather than as eliminating as many of them as possible from that process or even in the pricing model example, right? You want to set the highest price that will result in the thing being sold, right? So you want to bias your model towards higher prices. You know what's weird? No. No? Oh. Well, this is where, okay, so models. There, there are multiple pricing models out there. Like Walmart has them, Amazon has them, Macy's has them, Nike has them. They all kind of talk to each other and we don't know this really well. This is kind of this misunderstood space. Algorithms talk to each other. They communicate with each other through their output. And if you look at the stock market, same thing happens. The, an algorithm buying and selling is in a way communicating with another algorithm. And in a lot of cases, these algorithms collaborate. And so sometimes raising a price has a cascade effect that is not necessarily positive. And that can be because of an interaction between models may cause your competitor to undercut you. And through undercutting you, they will pull more business in, and now you've lost revenue, and you've lost margin, because that other model responded to your change. It saw you increase price, it, and its rules, its hypothesis, led it to serve inference that this price would be able to pull customers away, because you're competing for the same dollars. And so now you raising the price caused their model, who is looking at your prices on a regular basis, to lower their price slightly. 
And so they ended up getting customers because their price was better on this particular item. And their marketing around that was better because it was targeted understanding your pricing model and raise your price too much. The other example where something like that could be bad is that a lot of times you have a recommender at the bottom of your screen saying, hey, what about buying this? What about buying that? And those items can be higher margin. And so you might want to give somebody a deal on one product so that they have enough left in their budget to buy a higher margin product. And if you look at electronics, your TV sets, very, very low margin, your cables, those types of accessories that you buy, cables are very, very high margin. So you want to take margin into consideration. And so if you cut a couple of bucks off of the television set, you're not losing much margin. However, if that causes the person to be more likely to buy a surge protector or some cables, now you've increased your overall margin of sale, even though the, the total price of sale has remained the same. And so there's, this is the, you know, the, the reason why machine learning is so much more complex and why we need so much more explainability is because of these interesting impacts that you only see if you understand the larger system. Nice. One thing you said earlier that really resonated with me is that merely by choosing what data you're going to collect, you're inherently biasing the hypothesis and what you're looking to solve. So how do you go about preventing that? That's an art. <laughs> so in some of the projects that I've worked on, some of the really like, you know, I, I needed people way smarter than I'll ever be to help me not do stupid things. You know, what you're hearing me say is a mimicry of what people with PhDs have sort of taught me through the years. And data gathering is an art. Controlling the way that you gather data, and not only the data that you've gathered, but also the conditions that you've gathered it in. So every data point has metadata, and that creates a provenance for that particular data point. And so you can have you know, one number, that's the data point that you gathered, and you can have five data points around it that describe how, when, what else was going on that might at some point in the future be important with respect to that data point. And in a lot of cases, your probability of, of you know, one thing given another thing is also relative to a third variable. And if you don't have that third variable, what you're going to want to do in the future, you won't be able to, because you're going to find out, oh, I needed that other variable in order to do more of a causal analysis on this. And so there, there's some really uh, artistic is the right way to do it. And it's scientific, and like I said, smarter people than I, but the way that you gather your data is really, really important. And more important than the data point is all the other pieces that you gather around it in order to describe that data point in a way that someone else can use it in the future. What's your philosophy on this? Um, because to me, when I'm building a, a machine learning model, like I'm cognizant of the fact that reality is fucking complex. There's a <laughs> lot of shit going on, right? And all I have to work with are artifacts from yeah. this real world data generating process that just happen to live inside of the database. And I'm trying to make an inference from these artifacts from the real world that we somehow managed to capture to then make a statement about how the process that generated this data behaves. So that's when a new data point comes in that is a, a byproduct of this thing that I'm trying to model. Um, I'm able to make an accurate prediction. Uh, that's kind of like my philosophy around how I'm building or what I'm doing when I'm building a machine learning model. What's, what's your take on that? I describe machine learning and the, the, I guess the objective of machine learning and the reality of what happens as somebody just randomly, like I pick somebody off the street, I give somebody 20 bucks and that person walks around, uh, you know, San Francisco's uh, a park or central park in, in in New York and just start pulling leaves off trees and gives me this basket. And now the company wants me to explain the trees and I have a random baskets worth of leaves. That's, that's my data. 
that's really what it is. Uh, you, that's all you got. You might get a stick in there if you're lucky. Like you might know trees have wood if you are lucky. That, that person might have been nice enough to gather something that was not what you told them to, which may lead you to a deeper understanding of trees than just the leaves. And that's how, I, that's how I explain machine learning, is you first get leaves and then you ask the question, well, looks like these were attached to something. It looks like somebody tore something off here. Maybe we need to go back and gather some more data to figure out you know, what, what are these leaves attached to? And then you might come back with more sticks and you go, ah, these sticks look like they were torn off. You know, and you kind of do this, it's this unraveling. And if you unravel enough, if you go deep enough, most, I mean, you have to stop at some point because you got a budget. There's a time limit and there's a budget. So you have to be really smart about where you stop. This is a rabbit hole. But at some point, you have to start dealing with the greater complexities of the system. And that's this slow unraveling process of gathering data that tells you there's more data to be gathered. Going to get that data and it'll tell you there's more data to be gathered. Making mistakes and gathering dirt when that's not a tree. That the, the tree lives in the dirt. It's a system that interacts with the tree, but that's not part of the tree. And so, you know, sometimes gathering mistaken data and having to do the analysis and the experimentation to realize, okay, that's dirt, that's the tree. We're talking about two separate things. But also at the same time, sometimes all the business cares about is what color the leaves will be next week. And all you need for that is leaves and temperature. And you can start figuring out very quickly, even though those two really aren't that well related, those aren't great data points. If you give me a temperature trend and enough data about what color leaves happen with what color temperature trends, I'm gonna give you a not bad model. My model's gonna not suck that hard. It's not gonna work like on a coconut tree. It's not gonna work on, you know, so there's, again, when I talk about these flaws, we know they're there. As long as we know where the flaws roughly are, and we know this model isn't great, but it doesn't suck. And as long as we don't overextend it, that's where I, like that's my metaphor for machine learning, is that you have to at some point stop. You will not get the full system because we, we have a hard time with real complex systems getting enough data to model them correctly and verifying that a model really works and isn't gonna get slapped in the face one day. So that's where I can, you know, especially in business, that's what I compare it to is you want a model that doesn't suck. You wanna know where it stops. You wanna understand that you can gather data forever, but you're gonna to have to stop at some point. And you will sometimes gather data that doesn't have anything to do with what you're actually trying to model. And sometimes you have to not fall in love with that data. I dig it, man. So open it up uh, for Nicholas and Curtis. If you guys got questions, go for it. If not, then um, we'll go ahead and end the office hours. Uh, so Curtis. Yeah, sure. Um, once again, thanks for inviting me, Harpreet, off such short notice. I mean, when I'm involved in conversations like this, I feel like I don't know a thing about what it is I do every day. And so um, thank you. Um, but um, I believe Vince, you were speaking about like um, your your model is your hypotheses and and like em ma ba basically emphasizing on explainable AI. Are, are, you, are you now saying that you completely rule out deep learning then as, you know, those, the models used for deep learn learning are quite difficult to explain and and get into i have a really hard time with deep learning models that aren't explainable but i don't completely discount them you know again they're useful as long as we can have some concept you don't have to 100 percent understand how they work they don't have to be 100 percent explainable but you have to have some concept of where they stop working and okay. yeah, so that yeah. you don't overextend sort of the inference that you're using. You don't convince the business mm. that this model will do something that ultimately it won't and it could cost the business money and could be disastrous. So you don't have to understand everything. Uh, on the flip side of that, I do believe that deep learning actually in many cases leads to a component of causal modeling. So I think deep learning can be a stepping stone towards causal ML and that's a long conversation, but I think deep learning has a role to play there. I think deep learning models, we're beginning to find out some fundamental 
patterns about deep learning models and some governing dynamics that are universal across deep learning models that can be validated using things like the do calculus and that whole mm -hmm. process there that like i said judea pearls kind of got me on this tangent where i think deep learning models are i think they're useful and i think they are sort of that intermediary step that we need so i don't think all deep learning models are worthless and even if you don't understand the model entirely i think that it can be reliable enough as long as you know where the gaps are as long as you don't overextend what it can what it can predict or, or classify mm -hmm. or whatever and then like i said i think it's a stepping stone to something more complex and more causal mm. okay right on man well vin thank you so much man for for hanging out and dropping some knowledge bombs on today's office hours man i really really appreciate you swinging by and uh, giving us all such an intimate lesson on on your philosophy in in machine learning, man. I really appreciate that. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate the I appreciate the invite. I was, you know, I'm thinking through my process when you guys ask me these questions, and I'm I'm hearing myself talk sometimes and hearing your feedback on it and saying ah, maybe I haven't thought this through all the way. So I really appreciate you kind of you know reframing, asking some good questions, sharing your insights too. It's like I said, it always makes me rethink, you know, have I, what have I missed? What did I mess up? Yeah, man, that's the one thing that I think it's, it's, I mean, there's many one things, but that mentality of, okay, what am I getting wrong? What am I missing here? Like just a slight hint. Okay. So how do I say this? You don't want to be unsure of your ability and your ability to get shit done, but you always want to be having this kind of, yourself looking over your shoulder you know does that make sense like there's got to be a part of you that's always like all right what am i really doing do i really get this am i really understanding this um while you're working man uh, hopefully i don't fucking sound like i'm crazy when i said that but uh that's, that's what i'm trying to get across there well no i mean yeah, what, what was that nicholas i said i know exactly i completely agree with your heartbeat that's a, a crucial skill to develop and there, we'll all refine our thinking over time, and it's just a, a matter of iterating on our current beliefs. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yeah, I mean, like Curtis's question taught me when I started talking about the causal, you know, the connection between deep learning and causal. I should have been able to summarize that better in two lines, and I couldn't. And that, for me, means there's a gap in my understanding. So those questions are great because when I hear myself give a half-ass answer, it, it's one of those. Wait a minute. Why didn't I give a better answer to that? Why didn't I have a better you know, there's something I don't understand, obviously. Well, Ben, sitting from here, my perspective, man, I feel like you understand this shit so well. <laughs> uh, it's definitely, um, it's evident in the way you speak about it. Um, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Uh, help me in thanking Vin for coming on the show. It's really oh. an honor and a privilege to have you on. And man, like I said, you've got a permanent invite anytime on Friday during this time. If you're free, you are more than welcome to stop by at any office hours. Um, this will be up on the podcast on Sunday morning, as well as the YouTube clip. Guys, be sure you tune in on Monday. I've got an episode releasing with Annie Duke. Um, Annie Duke's book, Thinking in Bets, changed my life. And um, I am beyond excited to release that episode. Um, you know, when I, when I, when I was writing down a, a, a dream list of guests that I would want to have, uh, number two was Annie Duke. Number one was Dan Ariely. Uh, number two is Annie Duke. So uh, didn't get Dan Ariely yet. I did get Jeff Chrysler, who co-wrote co a book with Dan Ariely. So maybe I'm going to make that happen somehow. But uh, having somebody that was like the number two on my list on the show to me is such a huge deal. Uh, so I hope you guys check that episode out. She goes deep uh, for about good 15, 20 minutes about, about elections, essentially, and um, all that goes wrong with polling for elections and decision-making in that context. So it's going to be very uh, well-timed with the U.S. elections happening on uh, the very next day, the following Tuesday. So again, guys, thank you so much for hanging out, man. I appreciate you coming on, and uh, we'll see you around.
Take it easy. I'm looking forward to that Andy Duke episode. All right, man. I'll send you a link for sure. I appreciate that. Take care, everybody. All right. Bye. Take care.